Hi, I'm Anna Peterson, and it's been a long time since I've held a microphone. The last time was at a karaoke bar. And <laughs> so hopefully this will go a little bit smoother than that did. <laughs> Um, our topic tonight is technology in the college classroom. Um, I'll be giving the introduction and then a brief history, and Mariah and Danita will give the other parts of the speech. Um, the history, we're going to go way back to the 7th century, and that's uh, when Europe began organizing schools to teach children. And that system moved along smoothly. It was tweaked and studied and evolved along the way uh, up to the point where the United States became a nation. And at that point, we adopted the same methodology for teaching children as was used in Europe. This me methodology for teaching children was termed pedago pedagogy. It literally means the art and science of teaching children. Malcolm Knowles is an authority on the subject and noted that pedagogy became the basis for the entire educational system in the United States. And it stayed that way for um, many, many years. And that was all fine and good until World War I ended. At the ending of World War I, soldiers returned home and began seeking educational opportunities. The college edu educators began to notice that the students in their classrooms were a bit more mature, uh, had gained life experiences, and they were just a little different from the traditional students that they had been used to um, teaching. Researchers began to do studies on adults and discovered that they could learn. And that just cracks me up every time that I, that I read that. I'm like, of course we can learn, but they had to do a study to, to prove that. And that was important. According to Knowles, the research was important because it opened up a whole new field of study. Um, and from that point, more research was done on adults and how they learned. From the research, a theory of adult education emerged, and it's, it's called uh, andragogy. And it's distinctly different from pedagogy. Andragogy was pursued as a field of study in Europe first, but by the 1970s, it began to emerge as a serious field of study in the United States. By the ninth, then, by the, in the 1980s, computers began to impact the college classroom. So you had a lot of action going on in the college classroom, a lot of things impacting it. And Malcolm Knowles realized that for adults to accept and benefit from computers uh, and technology in the classroom, that the computer industry itself had to understand how and why adults learned. And so he took it upon himself to approach the computer ind industry and teach them about andragogy. Uh, the principles of andragogy are adults need to know why they are doing something before they invest time and energy in learning it. Adults are task oriented in their learning and adults come into situations with a wide variety of backgrounds and experiences. And adults have a deep need to be self-directing. They want to make choices. They want to guide what they do. Also, adults' self-concept must be accounted for. Adults believe they are responsible for their own decisions and resent and resist situations where they feel others are imposing their wills on them. Adults also must be ready and motivated to learn. And those are the main principles of andragogy. Uh, you can see that learning um, a new technology or learning through a new technology it certainly poses challenges um, if the adult learner's needs and mindsets are ignored or, or overlooked. And this is especially true for instructors. Instructors have to be aware of the learners they are teaching and the best, best methodologies to use. That's where we are. In addition to keeping the principles of andragogy in mind, um, each person also has a different learning style, and those styles can be affected by lighting, temperature, furniture, sound, and surroundings. I think when we came in here tonight, we all felt a little bit different in this classroom as opposed to the computer classroom uh, that we're, we're used to. I felt a different feeling of community. I never sat next to... Dawn before, and Dawn and I had a nice little conversation, and, and it was nice. I got to meet somebody new that I hadn't uh, in the other classroom, so I enjoyed that. Uh, and so instructors do have a tremendous task in educating adults. 
They must decide what is to be learned and how learning will be evaluated, how to make decisions on the order and sequence of subject matter, and make decisions on teaching methods and student activities. I have a plan on having to hold this. <laughs> this would go smoother if I didn't have this. According to Lovell, um, for adult students to effectively learn um, results fr from, accord sorry, according to Lovell, for adult students, effective learning results from the accurate initial uh, reception of new information, followed by active recall and use of materials, and then making connection between the new material and what they already know. And there are a multitude of technologies available for instructors to use to create effective adult learning. The key is to pair the correct technology with a given group of students in a given situation. The use of technology in the classroom, according to Miriam and Cunningham, can be likened to the array of concentric circles that radiate from the center of a pool of water when a pebble breaks the surface. Um, my name is Donna De Harris, and I'm going to discuss the various sides of the issue of technology in the classroom, um, particularly the positives and negatives. Um, basically, 20 years ago, uh, teachers taught primarily from textbooks and lecture, and students learned pretty much the same way by reading and uh, taking notes, library research, and study groups. Today, with the introduction of the internet and computers in the classroom, it's just enhanced the way that we have of learning uh, different materials. However, with the development and use of technology in the classroom, it's produced both positive and negative results. Um, our positive result is computers. Computers have totally opened up how we learn. We have the flexibility and mo mobility of our learning choices. We can research from home. We can research, communicate, and take classes from our computers. Um, this is a big impact on how we have been able to learn. Also with uh, a positive is the various methods of learning that we've been able to, um, to do now that we couldn't do before. We can research online. We have learning sites such as YouTube, uh, Google videos, the, the Association of College Libraries and Research, and online classes. I think the beauty of online classes is you set your time when you want to take do your homework and when you read your lesson and you interact with your teachers and fellow students from the comfort of your own home and your bed slippers, which is, I think is kind of cool. Um, also, a positive with technology is communication. Students, um, now we aren't limited to just the office hour and having to go see the teacher. We have instant messaging, we have email, we have um, cell phones text messaging. Some teachers do participate in text messaging and being reached by the cell phone. So basically communication is 24-7. If, you, if you're if you doing homework at 3 o'clock in the morning and you think of something, you can pretty much email and somebody's going to be out there or that message will be waiting for the professor. You don't have to wait and, and when you see him next. I think technology, technology is positive when it's matched with the right, the right technology is matched with a student's um, learning ability and how they learn. Different students learn with different methods, and um, I think that um, technology has is, is helped that. Now, on the negative side, um, limited access to resources. Even though computers are becoming um, more affordable, not everyone can afford a computer. And um, also, it depends on where you live. Some people, I have friends who don't have internet access because of where they live. They live in rural areas, and. They still have dial-up, which I think is funny when you say, you know, they just have dial-up because I guess working at a, a college, I, I think everyone has fast, high-speed internet, and that's not the case. And also there's um, students who, if they don't have the resources, they have to use shared computers, like at the library or at the college, which also when you combine that with other people who have to use that, there's limited time um, that you can be on it. And also some colleges with the, the use of the bra, the, broadband width. It uses a lot of um, broadband to use like file sharing and different websites. So that is also a limited resource when you're using a shared computer. Um, another negative is um, learning differences. Not all students learn 
by the same method. Some students are still uh, textbook oriented and lecture oriented. So there's a little bit of frustration and difficulty learning how to navigate websites or look for information for um, just understanding how online classes work. So um, while technology is positive, there's some people that still have some problems, just especially adult learners, of getting a hold of the information and learning how to work with that and do their studies. Um, a final negative I wanted to talk about is miscommunication. Um, since we are able to communicate by email and instant messaging, there's the, um, the possibility of miscommunication. Sometimes a teacher, if, if you're, if a teacher is getting 20 different emails, sometimes, you know, he has to give out the same information. Some students may interpret it different, whereas if you're in a classroom setting, everybody's there, they can talk to him and, and see what he wants. And um, also not, not every um, teacher really wants to be accessible 24-7. They have other areas of the curriculum they have to take care of. They have notes and they have other classes. So while technology um, is positive, it doesn't always work. It doesn't always work in the fact that sometimes the machine could break down or students not be, might not be able to learn in that type of environment. So I believe that the use of technology in the teaching environment, while it's still fairly new, it's in its formative stages. And however, with the future of technology in classroom being optimistic, I think if it's used appropriately, it still has its full potential to be reached. So I'll turn it over to Mariah. One of the first things that come to mind regarding classroom technology is, of course, online learning. <clears throat> Currently, 1.25 million college students take all of their courses online, and then 10.65 million take at least some of their online courses. So roughly 12 million students are taking at least one online class. The number of students that are enrolled in a physical on-campus classes is around 15.14 million, so that's still more physical campus classes than online currently. Um, the forecast for 2014 is that only 5.14 million students will take all their classes in a physical classroom, and they're thinking that 3.55 million will take all of their classes online, and 18.65 million will take some of their classes online. And the growth of online education can be attributed to the achievement of for-profit schools like the University of Phoenix Online. Um, the current market for electric Electronic services and learning products is at 16.7 billion. They're projected by 2014, it'll be around 23.8 billion. <clears throat> One component of online learning that has been evolving over the past few years is virtual worlds. A virtual world is a computer-based simulated environment where users interact with each other in the form of avatars, which are typically two or three dimensional representations that walk, run, and sometimes fly across the virtual environments. Multi-user virtual environments are also called MUVs. They provide a space for higher level collaboration, simulation, testing of hypothesis, interaction, creativity, and performance. Second Life is a virtual world for adults. In Second Life, adults can build a house, go to a concert, meet new friends, attend a conference, or even get their education. There are more than 170 education institutions with a presence on Second Life. The Associate Vice President of Educational Technology for the Texas State Technical College says that virtual world environment gives them the opportunity to combine the flexibility of online classes with the effect effectiveness of face-to-face -face classes. He forecasts that moves are the next generation of online learning and industry training opportunities are going to be a main part of virtual worlds. The Texas State Technical College began offering a certificate in digital media in the fall of 2008 and that was delivered through Second Life. An associate's degree in digital media began being offered in January of 2009. We've got one video. No doubt by now you've heard something about virtual worlds, whether it's World of Warcraft, Star Wars Galaxies, or Second Life. In some cases, virtual worlds are games where people coordinate, collaborate, and strategize in order to perform a task. In other instances, 
virtual worlds are shared virtual environments where people socialize, work, learn, and of course, dance. You enter a virtual world through an avatar, a graphical representation of yourself. This is my second life avatar, North Lamar. Avatars can be customized by changing their clothes, gender, height, weight, and even form. Virtual worlds aren't just about avatars or making them dance. Virtual worlds are being used by companies such as IBM, Starwood Hotels, The Wall Street Journal, and Sony BMG, to name a few. All of us have been in a few of these. A committee meeting in a small room where only a few people are talking, but most of us are taking notes or checking our email on a laptop. Why are we meeting like this when we could be meeting like this? What we may lose in body gestures and facial expressions, we may be able to make up by being able to be there while being anywhere. Here's another example. A large auditorium type course, typical of an undergraduate history or biology class. In courses like these, it's typical for only about seven people to speak up during an entire semester. In most cases, instructors interact with their students by using PowerPoint slides, asking one or two questions, or by writing on a whiteboard. Are students gaining anything by being in a face-to-face -face environment? Why take a course in those conditions when you can take one like this? Is this really that different? The speaker has a PowerPoint screen and is lecturing to the students. At least students aren't sitting in a cramped desk and being interrupted by sleeping students. In this case, students can at least be at home with their laptops and notebooks spread over their desk while listening to their instructor through headphones. Students can either ask questions through a chat window, or in some cases, they can speak through their microphone. Virtual worlds are connecting people in a disconnected society. Join us next time as we talk about a pilot study where an undergraduate English course at the University of Texas at Austin incorporated Second Life into their course activities. Another form of distance learning is the WIMBA classroom. WIMBA classroom permits students to attend their class without physically being on campus. WIMBA classroom is a two-way communication program that uses video, audio, and chat tools to make the classroom available to students anywhere they have internet access. With WIMBA, students can access their campus class. If they have to miss, um, if they have to miss class, they can access it from anywhere with an internet connection. If they are parents and need to stay home with their children, if they're traveling for work, or if they end up moving in the middle of the semester, they can still remain in the course and use WIMBA. Uh, this has been very helpful for students affected by the swine flu that need to remain at home or in their dorm rooms. WIMBA classroom can also be used for group work. The instructor can create breakout rooms, and they can video conference or chat. This has been helpful for virtual mathematics courses as well. An instructor can write on the physical whiteboard in the physical classroom, and distance students can see it on their computer. <coughs> Another advantage of WIMBA is that instructors can record the class session and archive, archive it for students to view at any time. As technology changes, higher education will need to prepare their students for careers that are not even thought of yet. One way for higher education to get ahead in making sure they are training for future workforce is to partner with government, community, nonprofit, and business sectors. Companies have a major interest in employees that are skilled and can strengthen the business and, continue, and contribute worldwide. Many companies are partnering with, up with colleges to create, to create programs and skill training for current students to go to work at the companies right after graduation. Parkland College recently broke ground on a new diesel technology facility that has partnered with Case New Holland and Berkey's the partnership will increase the number of highly trained diesel technicians, which is a demand for Midwest area. So the company is going to benefit from the skilled um, diesel technicians, and then Parkland's benefiting because it's attracting students to their programs. So the future for higher education in technology includes increased types of distance or online learning and colleges training students to work on specific brands with which they have partnerships. Leaders in higher education will need to have a vision for the future and always be looking ahead at new innovations and ways of thinking that will help the college student. Any questions? Any questions? Education. I have a question. Okay. Generations past has uh, had a connection between a book 
and a letter or written word and image that's drawn or later on a picture. And that was the environment that uh, generations after generations uh, uh, had uh, their education to touch a book, hold it, had its weight in their hands, they feel the pages, and they turn the page. And so all of this has some wiring happening when you turn the page and look to the image and so forth. Now uh, they are moving into experimenting with uh, electronic books where you have a book library in the size of a smaller book, and you can just push a button, not turn a page, so the pages turn. And then you see electronics in front of you, and instead of seeing one image, you see it moving as a video. How, uh, in your research, did you find anything relating in how the newer generations are wired from childhood as they grow up into uh, adult as, uh, uh, age? Are they different people? Are they different thinkers? Are, well, well, I found with my own children, um, just the, they've never known just studying just with books and just with um, lecture. And they're, they're 9 and 11, and in their classroom, they are taught how to do research on the internet. Both my children know how to text, they know how to use a computer. So just the fact that they're learning this kind of stuff earlier, that's all they know. Whereas I've been trying to teach my mother just how to sign on a computer and navigate, and she's confused. She'd rather just read something in a book. You know, I, I thought about getting her one of those Kindles where you can download books on it, and I showed her one, and she was way too confused. And I said, you just have to tap the screen, it'll turn the page. And she, she prefers old school, and I think that's what she's used to, and my children, just from all their friends and what they're teaching in school, that's what they've grown up with. They don't know. I mean, they are used to being able to contact their father or myself instantly by text messaging or instantly by the cell phone. They don't have to wait and go somewhere to get on a telephone or something like that. See, even the terminology that we are now using it as household mm -hmm. to log on mm -hmm. or uh, navigate. I mean, if you say the, the term navigate 25 years ago, doesn't mean the same as navigate today, yeah, navigation. I, right, and I found my son, who's pretty clever himself, teaching his grandmother what the desktop meant, what it meant to file something, what it meant, what the hard drive was, stuff like that. And I was like, wow, how did you know that? And he just, you know, just in class, picking it up, listening to his friends, because that's what they're all into, you know. I remember being in fifth grade and, you know, not even know about typing. And he's already sitting down and typing and, and doing things, knowing how to research. So I think just because we've uh, developed more technology-wise, kids at a younger age are picking it up because their parents do it and because it's introduced into school. And so that's just the way they're wired because that's all they know. Okay. So let me turn the page to uh, the audience here. And being the masters you are, I would ask you, do you think the newer generation would be faster, fast thinkers, deeper thinkers? What do you think the shape of the, the society would be? Well, I have a three-year-old niece, and this year we went shopping Friday for toys, and they were all computer-related. She has a wireless keyboard that connects to the computer and she plays all these games on them and uses all this stuff. So she's three. So I think they're oriented to the computers because they're using them at a very early age. And she also holds conversations. And I've ran into three-year-old kids who couldn't barely talk. And I think it's the environment that she's in. She goes to, what is it, uh, Chesterbrook Academy out there at Research Park. She's been in there for about two years, and we saw instantly the progression. Well, don't you think, too, she's influenced by her family, you, you go to school? Yeah, and her mom buys her these, because it's my rule. I buy no toys. It's either clothes or educational objects, and I sort of got her into it, too. Mm -hmm. So we buy everything educational. We was buying her flashcards when she was two, mm -hmm. so forth and so on. But she has Leapfrog. She has them all. Even the puzzles that we buy are not the ones you put together. It's the little ones that little parts come out of, and you yeah. have to fit them in. So I think that to answer the professor's question, the kids are advanced because they're doing, and children grasp things quicker than adults.
Anything else? My question was for the um, the virtual learning in like the Second Life. Um, have they done studies? Because you know, uh, kids and even adults. I mean, you know, you're you're hurried, you're busy, you're. Um, you know, so you might not read the textbook or you might not uh, whatever, but, you know, people do take out time to play video games and they concentrate. So have there been any tests or studies done on whether the virtual learning online in a virtual world uh, has more retention value than, say, an online class or even an actual regular classroom? Didn't find anything about that. I think it's still too new. Yeah. Okay, um, most of us, or some of us at least, knew about this case where a, a baby girl was prevented from the outside world, and she was kept for 25 years ago, I mean 25 years of her age, in a, in a, bath, in a basement, a con not connected to any uh, source of anything. And she was, when they discovered her, uh, she w was afraid of people because she thought they are creatures that uh, can harm her. She was uh, afraid of the light, seeing the sun. She was not able to move. She couldn't talk. They started to educate her, to, to teach her how to speak for eight months, and she couldn't uh, catch, and she died later on. Uh, compare this to the technology that you give the children from year one, two, three, and so forth, and what the, the environment that you expose the, the, the uh, children to affect them. What, what would be the difference? Is it the environment or the person himself or herself? I think it's a combination of both. I, I do. I think if, uh, if, you're, if you're exposing your children to uh, the different technologies and also if they are uh, intellectually ready for it, they, it, it goes hand in hand. Both of them. Mm -hmm. Okay, question for all of you again, masters of technology. 20 years ago, one of the questions that was uh, very popular in interviews, when they interview if somebody, they ask lo lots of questions, and one of the questions was, do you see movies a lot? Uh, do you like to see movies? How many movies uh, you see per week or something like that? And uh, they gave the explanation in workshops why the, uh, employers would ask people about that. They want to see how much of the time uh, uh, of the employer he or she is spending in an unreal things, in another life things, not real life things, but to go to the world of a movie, to story that's made up and uh, not reality. And what they said that 95% of the employers do not, do not want their new uh, a candidate to see much more movies because he will be living in virtual worlds. worlds. He is not realistic. He is we're living in a f big fantasy. You see? Compare this to Second Life and uh, Avatars and so on. What do you think? Today, if they ask the question, maybe they want, they require that they live in another life or have a meeting or something. What do you think? What this shift of paradigm in 20, 30 years? I, I think it depends on the learner. I think some, just like we've been talking about, you know, uh, the right technology applied to the to that particular learner, it's it can be helpful or it can be frustrating and, and hard to understand. So I think that's the beauty of the technology is there's several methods of learning and so that one person, if they can't, if they don't do very well in online classes and they do better in class situations or if they do better, you know, vice versa. It, I think that's the beauty of technology progressing as it has. Moment of truth. Are we getting more, are we giving the world more of virtual things, unreal things, so that people after a while, a generation or so, there will be unreal people. He is or she is sitting with you and they are thinking of avatars and funny things and changing the personality, changing the weight, changing the dress, and they are living in a different world. They are talking to you, but they are 
are you talking to me or talking to my image that you think that you are thinking to your image or something? Are we confusing the, 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 the norms of dealing with a certain person to a certain person? Now we have three persons talking to three persons. You do the math. What do you think? We really love World of Warcraft. I don't know if you guys have children who play World of Warcraft. <laughs> um, and they have their friends that they talk to while they're playing this game. And then they'll, those same friends will come over and they'll have totally different conversations when they're at our house. So, I mean, I think they definitely realize that, that one is a game. The World of Warcraft is definitely a, a, a game. And reality is reality. I mean... So yeah, so I haven't seen that with my children, but I did notice a big switch with my child who went away to college in that he would spend a whole lot of time doing World of Warcraft in high school. And now that he's in college, he's realized that, oh my gosh, you know, I've really got to be a part of my college experience or I'm not gonna be here for very long. So, you know, that was a big awakening for him. Yeah, I would say too that it, it it would depend on the person. I think that a person who would be more likely to be swallowed up by that environment, um, our technology today gives them that opportunity to, you know, become a hermit or, or not to leave the house and play World of Warcraft and order their groceries delivered. And, you know, there's been movies about people who've never, they just don't leave their house anymore because they don't have to. And so, you know, 50 years ago, well, that wasn't an option because you couldn't just order your pizza online and you couldn't, you know, do everything on the Internet. You had to go outside. So I think in some aspects, some people are affected by that um, if they're already predisposed to that, perhaps. Um, but then most people would be able to, um, you know, be able to separate fantasy from reality. And while you can use it to relax or escape reality for a little bit, you know, when you have to go back to the homework or stuff, then, then you do. Is daydreaming bad or good? Some people say daydreaming is not good because you leave the reality and dream while you are awake. Some people would find something good about daydreaming because it energizes people and maybe brings new ideas. This will be uh, your pebble for next semester. <laughs> okay, any other questions? Would you like to give them a hand? <laughs>